Welcome to Boston, Massachusetts, and welcome to Game 4 of this division series between the Cleveland Indians and the Boston Red Sox. Fans filing through the gates here at Fenway, hoping they will see a Red Sox victory here at home in the postseason for the first time since the 1986 World Series. And welcome to the broadcast booth, everybody. I'm Joe Buck, along with my partner, Tim McCarver. Now, Tim, just like we talked about moments ago in the pregame show, the big story around here, who's going to pitch, Pedro Martinez or Pete Shorek? But maybe a bigger question, who's going to help? Who's going to help Mo Vaughn and Nomar Garcia Parra in this Red Sox lineup? Who's going to drive in some runs? Because only two guys have supplied Boston pop in this three games thus far. Mo Vaughn, Nomar Garcia Parra. Garcia Parra has 10 RBIs. Mo Vaughn with seven. The rest of the team with one. As a matter of fact, Spots five through nine in the order have one extra base hit. So Mo and Nomar need some help. Meanwhile, uh, a lot of help for Mike Cargro's Cleveland Indians. In fact, the middle of their lineup is very deep and very solid. And in this series, they've been very productive. I think uh, the Cleveland Indians, a case could be made about their balance. Manny Ramirez with a couple of solo home runs in yesterday's game. Kenny Lofton had a solo home run. And the one guy you don't see in there is Jim Tomey. So there's much better balance in the Cleveland Indians lineup. For the Indians, young 23-year-old right-hander Bartolo Colon will be on the mound trying to get the Indians back to the ALCS to take on the Yankees. Meanwhile, Pete Shorek, not Pete Martinez, will pitch for Boston trying to force this game back to Cleveland. We'll come back with the first pitch, the starting lineups, everything for you. Remember, Fox is your home for the 1998 World Series. Well, welcome back to Fenway Park. It is October 3rd. It is October weather. And Tim, you and I were just talking before we came back from the commercial break. It's cool. Mm -hmm. There's a, a lot of anxiety in this ballpark. Fans wondering if the Boston Red Sox will force a game five tomorrow night in Cleveland. It, it just feels like uh, it feels like playoff baseball. It feels like uh, fall now and uh, it, it feels like something big is about to unfold before us uh, on a Saturday afternoon at Fenway. It really does. Uh, the, the autumnal weather here as uh, New England's trees are changing clothes and uh, what a what a great ballpark for postseason play and the Red Sox hopeful that uh, today's postseason game will be different from their last six. They have lost six straight postseason games in this park and fans around here wondering if maybe this is the last time they see Mo Vaughn in a Boston Red Sox uniform this could conceivably be his final game in a Red Sox uniform and wearing the number 39 on the back of his hat today is the day for Daryl Strawberry in which he will undergo the operation to remove the cancerous portion of his colon about a walnut size uh, tumor and of course all of baseball is thinking about Daryl Strawberry uh, on this day and again congratulations to the New York Yankees for getting back to the American League Championship Series they did it for the 4 nothing win last night in Arlington a look at the starting lineup for the visiting Cleveland Indians they lead it off with Kenny Lofton in center field Omar Vizquel batting second at short David Justice is in left field as he was here yesterday and Manny Ramirez has really been pounding the ball in this series and has 11 postseason home runs. Number one, the Cleveland Indians franchise. Travis Fryman at third base. Jim Tomey, the DH, with Sexton at first base. Sandy Alomar is the catcher. Enrique Wilson is batting ninth at second base. And you look at the Boston Red Sox defense. Darren Lewis so good in center field. He has really made a difference in the lineup for Jimmy Williams. He's also had a good year at the plate. And it's Pete Shurek, the left-hander, on the mound. Not Pedro Martinez. They hope to have a chance to pitch him tomorrow night in Cleveland. And here's a look at the left-hander who started the year with Houston. Talk about Darren Lewis in center field. Pete Shurek hoping to keep the ball in the ballpark for Darren Lewis and for all the outfielders, something the Red Sox pitchers were unable to do against Cleveland yesterday. Here's a scouting report on the Boston left-hander. He's recovering from with his velocity. He had elbow surgery back in 1996, and he's developed a slider when he's ahead on an 0-2 count or a 1-2 count. They call it his check swing slider. His curve, his curveball is still effective, but his best pitch, his straight, 
change up and that's it right there. So Shorick who was a late addition to this Boston Red Sox team in fact acquired August 6th from Houston for cash ends up pitching the game in which the Red Sox are facing elimination in this division series you got a quick shot of Pedro Martinez who has said today he said yesterday he said the day before he was willing to pitch on three days rest but he is an untested pitcher on three days rest and Jimmy Williams has said we're going to have to win two games to get to the next round anyway and why force Martinez today and look nobody stands to benefit or gain more from the Red Sox advancing to the next round of the playoffs than Jimmy Williams and nobody knows Pedro Martinez better than Jimmy Williams and maybe Joe Kerrigan who was with him in Montreal if they don't think he can pitch today to me that's good enough this broadcast is also available in Spanish by utilizing the SAP button on your television Kenny Lofton will lead it off he'll be followed by Omar Vizquel and David Justice what I just said however about Pedro Martinez not pitching today is not the common feeling here in Boston they want to see Pedro Martinez pitch today and that is the debate raging on here in this area. All Red Sox fans <laughs> saying, look, you got to get to game five anyway. Put him on the mound and take your chances tomorrow night. One ball, one strike on Kenny Lofton. This Callan Justice will follow here in the first inning for the Indians. And Lofton into left field. Left center field to be exact, and Darren Lewis is back to get it in front of that big green monster, one away. Yeah, what Jimmy Williams told us before the game makes so much sense. He has to win two more games to go to the American League Championship Series. And why take two pitchers out of their rotation? Today, Pete Short is pitching with normal rest, and if the Red Sox win today, then Pedro Martinez will be pitching with his normal four days rest tomorrow night in Cleveland. Here's Omar Vizquel, who is hitless in this division series. A strike over the outside corner from Pete Shorick. And again, Joe Kerrigan was with Pedro Martinez, 26-year-old right-hander in Montreal. As Shorick brings it low and away, one ball, one strike. And Pedro Martinez has worked only once as a starter on three days rest, and today is not the day. Vizcal into left field, well hit. Back at the track is the left fielder O'Leary, a couple of steps in front of that big wall. Troy pulls it down for the second out here in the first inning. I don't think uh, either of those balls would have been up against the wall had the wind not been blowing but the wind is blowing slightly about seven or eight miles an hour out toward right field so it could uh, affect the balls into left center and down the line in left field slightly David Justice now and a look at what he has done with a home run an average of 250 in the three postseason games so far this year and he bats with two out nobody on here in the first Ground ball to first for Ball. Makes a very good play. Gets it out of his glove. And it's a very good first inning for Pete Shurek. The Indians go in order. The Red Sox come to bat. A big ovation for Shurek as the Red Sox hit the dugout. First base is a left-handed thrower's position. Most of the throws go into the infield. But for the Red Sox, it's a good thing that Mo Vaughn has the glove on the left hand. Makes it easier for him on that in-between hop, the little shuffle off to Shurik to end the inning. And a big ovation for the combination of Mo Vaughn and Pete Shurik as the two headed for the dugout. Shurik for getting through a perfect first inning. And Mo Vaughn, who is a fan favorite here in Boston. A look at the starting lineup for the Red Sox. Jimmy Williams leads it off with Darren Lewis in center. John Ballantin back second and third with Mo Vaughn hitting third at first base. Nomar Garcia Parra cleans up at short. Mike Stanley the DH with Troy O'Leary in left. Scott Hatterberg is the catcher. Mike Benjamin at second. And Darren Bragg is in right field batting ninth. The right-hander Bartolo Colon, just 23 years old, possesses an above average fastball and had a great first half of the 1998 season. Hits the outside corner 
with a fastball, strike one to Darren Lewis. Bartolo Colon with the facial characteristics of Andres Galarraga, the first baseman of the Atlanta Braves. That misses outside, one ball, one strike. You can't call it a collapse, but when you look at the season for Bartolo Colon as it started to wear on, he was an American League All-Star, was nine and four. The best ERA in the league at 2.46 after the All-Star break. Five and five with an ERA over five and a half. Strike two on Darren Lewis. Bartolo Colon also honoring Daryl Strawberry with a number 39. That's down the right field line fair. Played by Manny Ramirez. Going to have a play at second. Ramirez puts it in his pocket. Darren Lewis has a leadoff double. inside the line just inside the bag and Manny Ramirez comes up with the ball cleanly but I do not think he had a proper grip on the ball and for that reason held on to it Darren Lewis almost like a left-handed pull hitter hits the ball to right with consistency doubles for the Red Sox to open it he ran right in the face of Manny Ramirez who came up ready to throw had a shot at him but pulled it back and now Valentin digs in as the Red Sox try to take that early lead. Strike one. The numbers for Bartolo Colon. First full year in the big leagues and it started to wear on him and his arm late. In fact, they skipped his spot in the rotation down the stretch. Alone trying to pitch around a leadoff double here in the first. One ball, one strike. Good numbers with the average for Valentin, but no production, no RBIs for the veteran third baseman. It's jammed, and that's foul. Bryman over to give it a look, and it's two rows deep for strike two. Joe, talking about Bartolo Colon and his tired legs or his tired arm, Mike Hargrove uh, telling us before the game that uh, it was one or the other. I mean, he pitched 204 innings this year. He's only 23 years old, and there are an awful lot of young pitchers who come up through the minor leagues, and they are never battle-tested for big league play. The most innings at Cologne in six years in the minor leagues ever worked was 128 innings. And now to step into a role and work 204, it's understandable he has a tired arm or legs or whatever. Here's the one two to Valentin. Here's that mid 90s fastball up and away, two and two. Detailed for you with a graphic, the good start. The poor second half for Cologne. But you can wipe all of that away. First postseason start for the 23-year-old, and Valentin stays alive as the count stays two and two. Okay, there is nothing tired about the way he's delivering the ball tonight. He is blowing that fastball. What the Red Sox hitters will try to do, two things. Try to sit on the fastball when they're behind in the count and try to make the fastball be down in the zone. The one upstairs explodes. Full count on Valentin. With the heat coming for the Red Sox, Vaughn and Garcia Parra to follow. Balls, two strikes after a leadoff double by Darren Lewis. And Cologne in first inning trouble. A double, a walk, and now 
trouble with Mo Vaughn digging in. This visit to the mound by Sandy Alomar Jr. only prolongs the ovation for Mo Vaughn, who is one of the fan favorites in the history of this great franchise here in Boston. Coming into the divisional series, 0 for 14. That happened back in 1995. And he erased that with an opposite field three-run homer against Jarrett Wright in game one. He has two on with nobody out. The Red Sox facing elimination here in game four. That is out of play off to the left side for strike one. That is why it, or where American League pitchers try to pitch Vaughn in under the hands inside under the hands. However. Don't get it down and in because that's his long ball. From mid thigh to the bottom of the letters and inside under the hands to Vaughn. Vaughn broke his bat with that first strike, so he gets a new one. And now works on it with pine tar and that stick. As he walks back with a no one count. Big numbers in the postseason for Vaughn. All of the RBIs coming in game one. Strike two. Cologne went outside to Vaughn, but you can't feed him a steady diet of balls outside. But once again, that is the zone where pitchers try to pitch him. That last one, a fastball on the outside corner. Vaughn quickly in the hole, 0 2 with two on. Nobody out in the first inning for the Red Sox. 1 and 2. 98 miles per hour from Bartolo Colon. Nobody out. Cologne's going to have to come right after Mo Vaughn with Garcia Parra waiting on deck. Mike Cargrove did not know what he would get out of his 23 year old right hander. Not a good start. With a double, a walk, and now two and two on Vaughn. strikeout for Cologne 98 miles per hour on a cold October day just too much heat for Mo Vaughn give you an idea about what Cologne is trying to do watch Sandy Alomar behind the plate fastball fouled off that's inside fastball on the outside corner fastball inside misses and now the breaking ball a kneecap ball and now he just blew that one by that's how a guy like Cologne can get out of trouble. He could strike guys out. And that's what he did to move on. Chance of MVP is Nomar Garcia Parra digs in with two on, one out. A strike over the inside corner. According to the home plate umpire, Tim Tashida. Garcia Parra, 10 RBIs in just three games in the postseason. One ball, one strike. Sheeta behind the plate with Coble at first, Terry Kraft at second, Derwood Merrill at third, Jim Joyce and Richie Garcia are down the line. Darren Lewis can run. 
He's a lead runner at second with Valentin at first. And a one ball, one strike count on Garcia Parra. Two and one. The Indians really have to look at today's game as their clear shot at getting to the next round. Not to say that they can't beat Pedro Martinez tomorrow night. But the odds against them certainly increase with the likes of Martinez on the mound. Colon trying to keep it a scoreless first inning. Two on, one out, two balls a strike. Two and two. The Indians, should they lose this afternoon, will go back in front of that great crowd of theirs at Jacobs Field. But they'll have to, to deal with Pedro. And that's never a pleasant task. 11 to 3 was the final in game one in that situation in Cleveland before that great crowd against Pedro Martinez and Boston got game one. They've lost the next two as Garcia Parra takes inside and the count runs full at three and two. I think Jimmy Williams sends his runners right here. If you're the catcher in a situation like that and speed is your front runner, you think about going to second base to get the trail runner in case the batter strikes out. And a look back at second by Colon. Jared Wright watching from the Indians dugout. As Colon brings it on three and two. Runners go, and Garcia Parra grounds the short. The runners advance to second and third as Vizquel takes care of it to his right. Two down. And by starting the runners, any hopes of a double play, although highly unlikely with the way Garcia Parra runs, but by starting the runners, it ends up at least second and third instead of first and third with two out here in the first inning and a great job by Cologne first and second nobody out he's not out of the woods yet but he has retired Vaughn and Garcia Parra and now we'll work with Mike Stanley second and third with two down here in the first inning and Stanley grounds to short Vizcal to his left those are automatic Bartolo Cologne a leadoff double then a walk Vaughn, Garcia Parra, Stanley in order. Manny Ramirez will lead it off in the second here in Boston. No score. Now, while yesterday's game featured the home run ball, a lot of the hitters were talking about how difficult it was in the late afternoon to face Major League pitching, no matter who was on the mound, because of that glare in the background. Nagy was just dominating here yesterday for Cleveland. And the Red Sox hope that that glare will help the work of Pete Shorick in the start this afternoon as Ramirez pops it up foul and out of play for strike one. And because that glare is so tough in a day game, a twilight game, here in the Gloman in Boston, that's why it's uh, extra necessary to have that blacked out in center field, as you can see right there. Matter of fact, we played the 1967 series here, the Cardinals against the Red Sox. In those seats, there were people in it. You talk about hard to see with all those white shirts. Looked like about 100 baseballs coming at you when the pitcher wound up. Nothing and one to count on Manny Ramirez, who gets time from the home plate umpire, Tim Sheeta. Ramirez, this postseason, with a couple of home runs and a few extra home run trots. <laughs> Yeah, he has four home run trots and two home runs. Manny upset it himself after uh, the second time that he trotted thinking the ball was out of the ballpark in Cleveland. And uh, he had a single on one, and then he had to bust it for a double on the second one. He was busting it out of the batter's box here yesterday, though, as Ramirez fouls it back and out of play. Yesterday, Manny Ramirez had a two-home run game. This the shot off Brent Saberhagen in the seventh inning. But he wasn't finished. That one just got over the green monster and left. And then this laser beam into left that got out in a hurry off Dennis Eckersley, who looked stunned 
that Ramirez went down to get that ball a good pitch down and in and Ramirez shot it out of here for a two homer game. He set up here at 0 2. That's that slider we were talking about developed with Joe Kerrigan and the Red Sox. They call it the check swing slider. And here it is right here. You'll notice the parallel break in on the hands of Ramirez. That is a different look from Pete Shuring. Ramirez down the line, but hooking foul. That is not a different look from Manny Ramirez. Well, you talk about locked in. Talked about the two home runs and 11 total in the postseason for Manny Ramirez, a franchise record. That's the one thing that Manny has been able to do lately, handle the ball upstairs. He broke into the big leagues as a low ball hitter, but handles a high pitch better. There are the 11 home runs and where they stack up. All-time postseason home run leaders yet get out a boatload of asterisks. Because the first couple of guys didn't have the wild card, the division series, the LCS. Ramirez into left field. Shorek had him reaching for it. And Pete has retired the first four Indians in order. Joe, you're talking about the glare. I think it would behoove the Red Sox if that sun stays out for another two or three innings. When the sun goes behind the clouds, it's uh, it's much easier to hit here. And I think it, as you said, favors Shurik much more than it would a guy like Colon. Shurik needs it. Colon doesn't. Well, we've had shade. There's some clouds overhead, and they roll by. So at times, we've played in shade. Fryman into left field. Back at the track is O'Leary to play it off the wall. Midway up, and Fryman has a double. First hit for Cleveland. Halfway up the green monster and left. O'Leary was back there acting, Tim, as though he was going to catch the ball, and it hit halfway up the wall. Well, you've got to explain this to me. Why decoy anybody when there's nobody on base? I can understand if you have a man on first, a man on second. But if you have the hitter, what is this designed to do? Get the hitter not to run? Well, he's going to be running anyway. Why is Troy O'Leary decoying in that situation? Doesn't make any sense to me. Manny Ramirez has already learned his lesson. He would have been running. He did here yesterday. And Travis Fryman is a guy you don't have to worry about. Right. And he ends up with a one-out double. Now Jim Tomey. Two out of 12 with those two home runs in this division series with Boston. 30 homers on the regular year for Tomey. And he bats with a runner at second one out. And he's up on the count 2-0. I think the, the one reason that Mike Hargrove feels comfortable with three left-handers in the lineup today is that Pete Shurik doesn't have a pitch that is designed to go inside the left-handed batters. Everything goes away, allowing the left-handed batters to really aggressively go into the ball. You don't have to worry about that tailing fastball. The 2-0 from Shurik is down and away for ball three, three and 0. Richie Sexton waits on deck. So a perfect first inning for Shurik. Retired Ramirez to start the inning. Now a double by Fryman and the 3-0 pitch to Tomey. On four straight, a walk to put two on here in the second inning for Cleveland. That'll bring in Richie Sexton. The first baseman, Richie. Who took Jackson. over at first base when Jim Tomey went down. Breaking that bone in his right hand, Tomey did, missed six weeks. Went down August 7th. And Richie Sexton stepped in and shocked everybody with the way he pounded the ball over the wall. He hit 11 home runs in only 174 at bats. Two on, one out, and ball one just inside for sure. You have a big strike zone for which to throw with Sexton up there. 6-8. Strike zone from here to Boston Commons. This pitch just inside. So five in a row have missed from Shurik. 
That's pulled foul. John Hart, the general manager of the Indians, went out and obtained Cecil Fielder from the California Angels or the Anaheim Angels. There's John and his wife. And then when Cecil Fielder kind of got Cecil because of insurance, and then when Richie Sexton did so well, then they released Cecil Fielder, assured that Sexton could do the job. Runner stealing third. That's Priman, and he picked everybody off. Shorick didn't pay enough attention. Hatterberg didn't even try a throw, and it's first and third, only one out. That's a timing steal. Third base is easier to steal than second base. No one's holding you on, even though there is a shorter throw. But Travis Fryman timing Pete Shurek. And bang, he's gone. Hatterberg, the ball got caught up in the web, and Scott couldn't get it out of there in time, so he just ate it. The pitch was a strike. It's one and two on Sexton. First and third, one out. Sexton strikes out. A big strikeout. And the first of the afternoon for sure. Three fastballs and now the curveball and a huge strikeout for Shurik. So Colon had a big strikeout of Mo Vaughn in the first and Shurik here, Sexton in the second. The Shorick has faced Cleveland this season while with Houston. He got a no decision and pitched rather well five innings. One run on just six hits on June 26th. Houston eventually lost that game to the Indians. Now with first and third, two out. Here's Alomar. <laughs> Sandy takes a strike. Alomar had a down season offensively during the regular year and the postseason hitting 300, three out of 10. <laughs> to the shortstop, big pickup by Garcia Parra. That was a rocket. And Garcia Parra with a backhanded stab, the force at second, and Shurik is through two scoreless innings. Bottom of the second in Boston, no score. Keep it on Travis. Anything you hit to the left, you know, deep, make sure you go down close to second in case it does come off the wall. Yeah. All right? Okay, be ready now. Watch the line drive in front of you. The voice of Al Bumbry, the first base coach for Cleveland, talking to Jim Tomey is O'Leary. It's a bullet to the right side, picked up by Enrique Wilson, one away. And reminding Jim Tomey that the wall influences almost everything anybody does in this ballpark. The wall, the monster. There it is. And that's not the only tough part with playing the outfield here at Fenway Park. The wall is part of it, but it is asymmetrical with a capital A. <laughs> One out, nobody on, and a strike over the outside corner to Hattiebert. Start talking about the different angles that you have to play as an outfielder here at Fenway Park. And it can become a headache in a hurry. Hanneberg takes the pitch low and away, one and one. Yeah, this is uh, this ballpark, and what a national treasure it is, is the uh, just the opposite of the cookie-cutter stadiums that came into the late 60s and early 70s. More angles than a Ken Starr investigation. I mean, it's one after another, and then there's an angle on top of another angle in left center field and in right center field as Hatterberg takes a strike of the outside corner two and two. Hatterberg batting with one out nobody on and Benjamin to follow. That's out in right center 420. Hatterberg takes high and a count full three and two from Cologne who got around a leadoff double and a walk in the first. Second walk handed out by Cologne. We will tell you that today's overhead shots are courtesy of the Goodyear Blimp Stars and Stripes based in Pompano Beach, Florida. 
at the controls captain Jim Maloney from Vienna Virginia well if you want to know what it's like to face a young 23 year old fireballing right hander Bartolo Colon this at bat for you from catcher cam as Benjamin tips it foul for strike one. And you do not have a lot of time to, re to react. That ball sinking in on the hands of Mike Benjamin. My dream matchup in postseason play, you never know whether you're going to get it, but Mike Benjamin against Kerry Leitenberg of the Braves. Because of the facial hair. Sideburns. <laughs> Nothing in one, the count one on, one out, and that pitch up and in, and you can see the helmet of Benjamin ducking through your picture as he at least was chased off the plate. Yeah, Cologne trying to separate those sideburns right there. Mike saying that even his children, he has three children, and even his children get on him with one of those dead. A lot of time in front of the mirror. One on, one out. Benjamin showing bunt, taking a pitch high, two and one. And Alomar, the veteran catcher, out to talk to his young right hand. It's the right count to hit and run, but not the right pitcher. Jimmy Williams saying Bartolo Colon, uh, not only a high ball pitcher, but wild, and he takes that in, into consideration. That's the number one thing, the control of a pitcher before he decides to hit and run or not. Benjamin a good swing on a pitch up two and two. One thing you can see from the catcher cam angle. Not only that you don't get a lot of time to react. But as you take a look back out at Bartolo Colon. See how tough it is to pick up the ball with that glare in the background. Oh, yeah. I mean it's out of that shadow. The hitter's background is Benjamin floats one into left. David Justice comes on to make a sliding catch. Throw behind the runner. Sexton's foot was off the bag and Hattieberg back anyway. That would have been a heck of a double play. Great front end from David Justice. I'll tell you, I think David Justice made such a good play. He picked Richie Sexton off first base. Justice made a play like this in yesterday's game. The sliding catch, the spin, blind throw to first. What if Sexton were on the bag? It would have been very close. You're talking about a guy 6'8 who's stretching over there. The section was never on the bag. No. Might have been caught watching the great catch <laughs> yeah. of David Justice in the left. And now the number nine hitter, Darren Bragg. During the regular season, hit a career high 279, is one out of eight in this division series. Here's a listen to the sound of that catch by Justice. Get back here! Oh, he's safe! You can hear the first base coach, Dave Chow, screaming to Hattieberg to get back, and then first base umpire Drew Coble calling him safe. Great play by David Justice. One on, two out, the 2-0 pitch. Bragg pops it up. Left side. Looks playable. Freiman gives way to his kill. And the inning comes to a close. We move to inning number three. We'll be back after this from Fox Sports, your home for the 1998 World Series. Back after this from your local station. One hit aside as we have played two. We go to the third. Pete Shorek back to work. Enrique Wilson, the number nine hitter. Getting the start in place of Joey Cora, who has struggled 0 for 8 at the plate. And Enrique Wilson has been a top prospect in the Cleveland Indians organization, which is filled with prospects the last couple of years. Wilson first up, and he takes a strike as Hattieberg did a good job of pulling that pitch back into the strike zone. One ball, one strike. 
David Copperfield couldn't have pulled that one back That's in right. the strike zone. And I'm not sure that I'd want to see him do it. <laughs> be honest with you. No. Wilson takes the ball. It's two and one. Jimmy Williams wondering how this will turn out with Pete Shurik. As he deals on two and one, that is the most obvious statement you could make, but it carries with it. And this start by Shurik carries with it a lot of history, which we will try to get through without dragging on at some point during the next couple of innings. Three balls and a strike, and Wilson pops it up. Near the mound, and Valentin wants it. Buddy Movon gives way. One out. Tomorrow, it's a Fox NFL Sunday doubleheader starting off with a classic NFC East matchup as the Cowboys take on the Redskins, followed by the Eagles battling with the Denver Broncos, plus other regional action. Coverage begins at noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific, right here on Fox. Here's Kenny Lofton. We will have a baseball game for you here tomorrow night. Somewhere, some city. If this series goes to a decisive fifth game, we'll bring it to you from Jacobs Field tomorrow night in Cleveland. Lofton pops it into right center field. A lot of room out there. And Darren Lewis in the sunlight puts it away, two down. And just to further confuse you, We'll give you the other scenarios. AL Division Series Game 5, Boston and Cleveland if necessary. Game 4 of the Cubs Braves Series if necessary. And that will depend on what happens tonight. For the Astros at the Padres, we know that'll happen. Game 4. That's tomorrow night. And if you're confused and you want it wrapped up succinctly, check out the Fox NFL Sunday pregame show and they'll lay it all out for you. Omar J Vizquel takes a strike. JB, Terry, Howie, and Chris have it all down. A little flare into center. Long run, Darren Lewis. Good play. And a 1-2-3 inning for Pete Shorick. He's doing his part. Now the offense will try to kick it in for Boston. Top of the order for the Red Sox. Bottom of the third. No score. Packed house here at Fenway Park as we prepare for the bottom of the third inning. Top of the order for Boston Lewis, Valentin, and Mo Vaughn against Bartolo Colon. Darren Lewis, who has the only Red Sox hit, led off with a double back in the first inning, takes a strike. So five out of 11, a great division series being put together by the Red Sox leadoff man. And a guy who really deserves a lot of credit. He is not a naturally gifted hitter. He's a hitter whose natural movement is that the hands come first. He drags the bat head through the strike zone, which means that he's going to hit a lot of balls to right field, particularly the fastball. Well, that just missed. Two balls and a strike. He's got Cologne talking to himself as he did not get this call. So two and one. A high strike, two and two. Mention how much credit Darren Lewis deserves. Career high is an average. Home runs, RBIs. And a strikeout here in the third inning is Bartolo Colon against Lewis looking. Let's hear from Cleveland manager Mike Hargrove on the start and the type of pitcher Bartolo Colon has become. He brings, a, he brings somebody that throws the ball 98 miles an hour. I mean, that's a fairly unique uh, um, uh, ability uh, to, to have in, in, uh, in the game of baseball. If Bartolo can stay ahead of hitters and get his breaking ball over for strikes when he needs to, then Bartolo has a chance to dominate the game. That misses outside for ball one to Valentin. I'll tell you how tough uh, Cologne can be. There were 49 players in the American League that hit over 300. 49. That was a composite average of those 49 players, 317. Against Bartolo Cologne, those 49 players hit 218. That's 
slow, 3-0. John Hart, general manager of the Cleveland Indians on your right. Watching the 23-year-old right-hander run the count to 3-0 on Valentin with Mo Vaughn next. That caught the corner, a 96-mile-per-hour pitch, so Cologne didn't let up to throw a strike. And it's 3-1. Valentin, a base hit into right. And John is on base for the second time this afternoon. Vital for Mo Vaughn to have somebody on when he comes up. And Ballantin sees to that with a single to right center. Well, two hits for Boston. Both have been to the right side from right-handed batters. This is that good fastball from Bartolo Colon, and now Mo Vaughn. Struck out with two on and nobody out back in the first. Double play ball to short. This Cal flips. Wilson in the middle. And the inning comes to a close. A big double play off the bat of Mo Vaughn, who is now 0 for 2. Cologne, Shorick, three scoreless innings as we go to the fourth. Here is our Aflac trivia question. Who is the last American League player to win the AL MVP and play for a World Series champion in the same year? It takes you back into the last decade. Not that far back, but still a tester. I think that's a fair hint. It was in the 80s. The mid-80s. Yeah. David Justice, Manny Ramirez, Travis Fryman as the Indians try to get a lead and get back to the ALCS. Pete Shurik on his normal four days rest. And should the Red Sox win, Pedro Martinez will pitch tomorrow in Cleveland. Four days rest. And you may be wondering if there was any precedent. Fans here at uh, Fenway Park in the New England area, Red Sox fans, remember gentleman Jim Lonborg, who started two games of the 1967 series on three days rest and won on two days rest. Faced Bob Gibson in game seven. And there are a lot of people in New England, and I'm not too sure that they don't have a very good point. Gibson was almost unbeatable in those days, but had Lonborg had one more day's rest, the Red Sox would have had a much better chance to beat the Cardinals. Justice started to throw the bat away on that 3-1 pitch called a strike. So 3-2 and two on the leadoff hitter, Justice here in the fourth. Right on the corner with the three-run fastball. Now the 3-2. Justice reaching for it. Mo Vaughn stays down on it. One away. And Justice is 0 for 2. Joe, in that 67 series after game one, I saw something that uh, I'd never seen before or since. Right there in center field, that's where the batting cage is kept uh, here at Fenway Park. And Carl Yastrzemski, after game one, he went 0 for 4, and he had the ground crew haul out the batting cage, and he took extra hitting after 163 games of the season. The next day, he had two two-run home runs against Dick Hughes and Joe Horner. So the batting practice worked. Manny Ramirez takes a pitch inside. Well, you start going down a list. There's the number. One of the five retired numbers when you add Jackie Robinson's number 42 here at Fenway Park. You start going down a list and you start going down a list of the great players. They weren't great uh, just by luck. The great players also seem to have a great work ethic. Oh, yeah. And that's a good example of it. Had a chance all year to follow Mark McGuire around, and he did a lot of the same thing. Before the final game of the season was in taking extra batting practice, 
in the batting cage and ends up popping two more home runs, getting to 70. A breaking ball for a strike to make it one and two on Manny Ramirez. Now, there were guys uh, with whom I played that had equal work habits as Yaz, but nobody worked harder than Carl Yastrzemski had become a great ball player. What a great player he was. A ball and two strikes, one out, nobody on. Manny Ramirez at the plate. Ramirez jammed and he fought it off. That's a good sequence right there. The fastball away for the first strike, then the curveball away, and then Shurik and Hatterberg tried to come back inside to Ramirez. But as we said earlier, Ramirez much more proficient at that high inside fastball now than he has been in past years. One and two, the count on Ramirez. One out, nobody on. Same pitch, same result as it gets out of play. Still one and two. One and two, and how'd you get there? We were talking about the sequence. First pitch misses inside. Now the second pitch. Now watch the curve. Curve ball to the outside part. Now he's trying to come inside. That was the slider. That last one. Still one and two to Manny Ramirez. Remember, it's not the location of the pitch, but how you got there that makes it effective. Ramirez pops it up. They came in on him again, and Benjamin waits, puts it away, two up, two down. So you saw the first five pitches, and here's the one that finishes Manny off. High inside fastball. Anybody who has questioned Pete Shurek's velocity, I think uh, they've been convinced through this first three and two-thirds innings. Jimmy Williams, Joe Kerrigan telling us that right around 90 pitches, and that's when they'll think about having Shurek removed. Ryman starts out with an 0-1 count. Jorick has thrown 46 pitches. So maybe halfway there. 90's the mark. That is strike two as they appeal to Drew Coble. And it's 0-2 on Fryman who doubled high off the wall his first time up. Remember we talked about the check swing slider. That was it right there. Effective. Another one. And a one-two count. Justice grounded out. Ramirez popped out. Just low. Two and two. After this pitch. Pete Shurek was heading for the barn, but just low, says Tim Tashita. And now the 2-2. From 0-2 to 3-2. On deck is Tomey, then Sexton, and as we told you during the open of this telecast, down through this lineup, Mike Hargrove puts one run producer after another. Two out, nobody on. Three balls, two strikes. From 0-2 to a walk in the second walk handed out by Shurik this afternoon. That'll bring in Jim Tomey, who walked his first time. Jim Tomey with a home run on a changeup from Brett Saberhagen yesterday. He is a very patient hitter. He does not swing at too many balls, likes the ball up and out over the plate. And he is a premier long-distance man. He has hit some crushing home runs for the Indians in his career. He got Saber hanging here yesterday, hitting it into the camera well out in center field. And that's a strike over the outside corner. Here's the shot off the bat of Tomey in the fifth inning. Going and going and going. 
right off the camera. Check on the runner, Fryman, who has already stolen a base in this game. So Shorek pays more attention now. Fryman stole third back in the second. It was first and third one out when Shorek came up with his only strikeout. The perfect spot for Boston as he got Sexton. Pete Shorek does not have a good move to first base because he does not have a big leg kick. There's nothing deceptive in that right leg of his. It's where a lot of your left-handers have great moves to first because they deceive when the leg goes up. But you can see that's not a big leg kick right there. And now Shorek has Tommy set up at 0-2. And this crowd again, they may have filed through the gates wishing for a Pedro Martinez start, but they are fully behind Shorek now. Who has allowed no runs on only one Cleveland hit so far. Breaking ball had Tommy bailing one and two. See, Pete Shorek is not a classic power pitcher. He, he has neither the slide step nor the high leg kick. The one, two to Tomey. Instead, another check on Fryman. That's three. Throws over to first. With Fryman at first. It does have Vaughn on the bag and open up a hole on the right side of the infield. Now Fryman's running. They have him picked up. Tagged by Vaughn. Caught stealing. 1-3, 6-3 to end the inning. So Travis Fryman, who's been bothered by a bad back in the second half of the season, got his rest last night. He's already stolen one. Now caught stealing. As we go to the bottom of the fourth, no score. Nomar Garcia Parra digs in to lead it off for the Red Sox in the bottom of the fourth inning. There is no score. Garcia Parra into deep right center. Ramirez back up by one to nothing Boston. Stanley takes a strike over the inside corner. Garcia Parra now with three home runs and 11 RBIs in this series. One and one on Stanley. Good swing there, but strike two as Cologne tries to bounce back after this. A breaking ball away, up in his eyes, but not for long. Tremendous power the other way by a guy who weighs 175 pounds. Wiry, and you talk about strong. Wow. Mm. The one two, Stanley up the middle. Vizquel keeps it on the infield and gets the out. What a play by Omar Vizquel. Stanley does not run well, which allowed Vizquel the chance. The ball off the mound, up the middle, and into the glove of a five-time Gold Glove Award winner. Had that ball not been slowed down, it was hit hard enough to get by Vizquel, but because it was slowed down, it allows a guy 
as acrobatic almost as Ozzie Smith at shortstop to make the play. Almost. Now O'Leary comes up empty. What a play by Omar Vizcal to his left. Watch the mound slow it down. Cologne did not get a glove on the ball, I didn't think. But a fine play by Vizcal. Omar has won five consecutive Gold Glove Awards, and number six ought to come his way after this 1998 season, in which he had a fielding percentage of 993. He made only five errors. O'Leary pops it up left side near the Cleveland dugout for Freiman. Two out here in the Boston fourth inning. So a leadoff home run by Garcia Parra. Stanley grounded out. O'Leary fouls out. Scott Hattenberg, the catcher, who walked his first time. Digs in with two out. Nobody off. In this series for Boston, of the 19 RBI, Garcia Parra has 11. Vaughn, 7, all coming in the first game. Veritek has the other. One and one on Hedeberg. There's only one guy that I saw here in Boston that had consistent power to right center field over the Boston bullpen, and that was Jim Rice, the hitting instructor of the Red Sox. But Jim, a much bigger man than Nomar Garciaparo. But I mean, you talk about strong. This guy used to hit him over the Boston bullpen with regularity. Hedeberg into deep center field, Lofton back. On the track to pull it in. From catcher cam, a look at Garcia Parra's third of the series. In and out, and over the wall in right center for a one to nothing Boston lead after four. Well, now Pete Shorek has a one-run lead as we go into the fifth inning. Tommy, who was at the plate when Fryman was out stealing. Then Sexton, then Sandy Alomar. Indians trail by one, and Tommy grounds one to the right side. Bo Vaughn took it away, one out. He may be 0 for 2 at the plate, but Mo Vaughn has made his presence felt in this game with a glove. Watch Mo Vaughn, the quick steps and the dive to smother it. Over to Shuri covering. Fine play by Mo Vaughn. That's his third good play in this ball game. So one out, and Richie Sexton digs in. And a strike over the inside corner. that check swing slider and Sexton checked it one ball one strike that slider uh, that Shurik threw throws rarely a strike but it looks like a strike and that's why you get the check swings only the right-handed batters will he throw that two balls and a strike Gorick is still allowed only one hit. And pitched around two walks. Three balls and a strike on Sexton. A young power hitter like Sexton wants the ball inside, inside part of the plate as you look at Sandy Alomar. Sexton wants to tie it right here. He tried, came up empty, three and two. balls two strikes on Richie Sexton Sexton hit 11 home runs in the big leagues 21 at Triple-A Buffalo the 61st pitch of the game from Shurik is ball four down and into Sexton 
Our Aflac trivia question, who is the last American League player to win the AL MVP and play for a World Series champion in the same year? The Aflac trivia answer, did you remember Willie Hernandez, 1984 with the Detroit Tigers? Sparky Anderson's Tigers that year won 35 of their first 40 games, sailed to a World Series championship against San Diego. San Diego that year defeated the Cubs to get there. One on, one out. Two and zero, and a visit from Mo Vaughn to Pete Shurek. Hey, Joe, the interesting thing about that shot from catcher cam on the Garshapara home run was how Sandy Alomar's glove came up right before Garshapara made contact. Let's watch again. When a pitcher is going to throw a breaking ball and you see the catcher's glove come up that's a bad sign those high breaking balls you don't catch those two balls no strikes on Alomar after the walk to Sexton and now three and oh so over the 60 pitch mark is Shurik and again Joe Kerrigan, Jimmy Williams, putting a 90-pitch mark on Shurik's start here today. Back-to-back -back walks to Sexton and Alomar, and the Indians are threatening here in the fifth inning. Down by a run, Cleveland has two on, one out, with the number nine hitter, Enrique Wilson, number coming up. 35, the second baseman. Enrique Wilson. Jimmy Williams telling us that if he makes a move in the middle innings, it will probably be Derek Lowe, particularly if it's a double play situation because he thinks Lowe has the best sinker on his ball club from the bullpen. Wilson takes a ball. And now the crowd starting to get restless as Shorick has gone wild here in the fifth inning. It is low getting ready now for the Red Sox out in their bullpen. A look back at second. Sex in the lead runner. Sandy Alomar is the trail runner. And a one ball no strike count on Enrique Wilson. Two on one out. Another one out of the strike zone from Shorin. Derek Lowe better get ready in a hurry. That's seven straight balls from Pete Shurin. And he's missing in the same spot, and that's bad. Low and away to right-handed batters. The one thing you do not want to do in a situation like this is coax a ball back into the strike zone. That uh, is when a guy on a 2-0, 2-1 pitch can hurt you with the long ball. And Wilson has power. Here it is on 2 and 0. It's Enrique Wilson at the plate now, the left handed hitting Lofton on deck. Red Sox leading by one in the fifth. Wilson pops it up. Bragg back to get it. Sexton tags and advances. It's first and third, two up. So the tying run 90 feet away. The go-ahead run is at first. And with two out, it's going to be up to Kenny Lofton for the Indians. That's not an incidental going to third base by Sexton. Because if you're on third with two outs and you have a hitter like Lofton, there are a lot of things that Lofton can do to tie this game up. Sets and tagging up. He goes to third without a play. But it's a lot different being on third base with two out and a speedster like Lofton up than a guy who can't run. 
But at the very top of the list is an infield hit. Yeah, or a butt base hit. Lofton in this series, five out of 14, and he bats with first and third, two out. One to nothing, the Red Sox leading here in the fifth. Back-to-back -back walks to Sexton and Alomar. Put Shorick in trouble. we got Wilson on the fly ball to right. And now misses badly with a pitch down and away to Lofton. Fine play by Scott Hedeberg. Quick feet. One ball, no strikes on Lofton. One and one. Kenny Lofton homered here yesterday and has driven in four runs in this series. Now up over 70 is Shorty. Kell next. Shorek one way or the other might be facing his last batter here with Lofton. That's pulled foul. And the count two and two. Here's what Kenny Lofton did here yesterday. This shot. Off Saberhagen in the sixth inning put Cleveland out in front. Out in front for good. Two balls, two strikes on Lofton. First and third, two out. The Red Sox facing elimination this afternoon against the Indians. Just tied, three and two. And now the runner at first, Alomar, will get a head start. Shurik tried the slider to Lofton that was high. Yes, it was, Kenny. Right. Into right center field. Darren Lewis over to get it. Inning over. Short sure, two walks. With through four and a half, one to nothing, Boston. A beautiful day in Boston. It's cool. It's October. Providing our shots from above is the Goodyear Blimp Stars and Stripes. Pompano Beach, Florida. The 192 foot blimp travels to an average of 40 cities each year. We thank them for their help in our telecast here from Fenway as Mike Benjamin leads off and hits it to center. Kenny Lofton in to make the catch one away. Here is the reaction of Pete Shurick after getting Lofton to end the top of this fifth. The second that ball left the bat of Lofton, he knew it was out number three. Darren Lewis made it official, and Pete Shorick is through five. That will be about as much emotion as you will see Pete Shorick show. One out, nobody on for Bragg, and that's a ball up and away. But still, for the Red Sox, nothing from the bottom of the order. Nothing. Five through nine, not a hit. One base runner. That was Scott Hattieberg, a one-out walk in the second inning. They combined nine out of 67 in this series. Five through nine.
Darren Bragg fouled out his first time up. Red Sox leading by one in the fifth, and that's up two and one. Right now, the Boston bullpen is quiet. So by getting around those back-to-back -back walks in the fifth inning, Pete Shorek may have bought himself another inning. I, I think they're looking, or Jimmy Williams is looking for one more inning. Shorek has thrown 75 pitches. We uh, told you folks that uh, he was looking right at that 90-pitch mark. So one would have to assume, unless it's a one, two, three, and five pitches, that Shurik will be through after the sixth inning. High heat from Cologne. Two balls, two strikes on Darren Bragg, who is one out of nine in this series. Mike Hargrove getting what he wanted and needed out of Bartolo Colon. But not getting the typical Cleveland offense against Pete Shurik. The Indians still have only one hit. Back to the top of the order after Bragg. Darren Lewis waits on deck. One out, base is clear, and a three-ball, two-strike count on Darren Bragg. This is one of those catch-me-if-you-can at bats. Darren Bragg knows what's coming. Everybody in the ballpark knows the fastball's coming, but at 97, 98 miles an hour, up in the zone, it's tough to get around on. Again on three and two, and Bragg pops it into shallow right. Out goes Wilson, in comes Ramirez, two gone. Joe Buck and Tim McCarver with you, along with our producer John Filippelli, our director Bill Webb. This game summary is brought to you by MCI. Garcia Parra has provided the only run of the afternoon, a solo home run in the fourth inning. Pete Shorek threw five innings, only one hit. Bartolo Colon. Doing his part, four and two-thirds innings, one run on just three hits. And each side has struggled with runners in scoring position. Combined 0 for 7. Defensively, Mo Vaughn has been a star for the Red Sox. Again, Boston, if they lose this afternoon to Cleveland, they are finished. The Indians will be back in the LCS. They've been there two of the last three seasons. We already know that the New York Yankees will be there. They finished off the Texas Rangers late last night after a three-hour-plus rain delay. Who will earn the right to face them in the ALCS? Two and one now on Darren Lewis. Speaking of earning the right, how about the Yankees? holding the Texas Rangers and their vaunted offense to one run in three games. Rusty Greer, Will Clark, Yvonne Rodriguez, Juan Gonzalez, four for 44 during the three-game series. Remarkable. Two balls and a strike. Lewis the other way, two and two. Joe uh, Joe Torrey telling us uh, before game one that if we don't pitch, we don't win. <laughs> Did they ever pitch? The Yankees only scored nine runs. <laughs> Doesn't take much, though, when he had that kind of pitching, and they were looking for some work for their bullpen. Two balls, two strikes. Lewis strikes out. That's number three on the afternoon for Cologne. He has pitched well. We have played five. Shorek back to work. One to nothing, Boston. Well, we would like to thank Sandy Alomar Jr. for agreeing to wear the catcher cam. And we give you a look at that last strikeout as Darren Lewis was blown away by Bartolo Colon. See that pitch dive a little down and in. And again, thanks to Sandy Alomar Jr. Thank Yvonne Rodriguez, Scott Service. 
kind enough to give us those rare looks at what it's like to face Cologne or Pete Shorick or whomever. One ball, one strike. Catcher cams running out of light. That's right. <laughs> I think he'll agree to put a floodlight on top of the thing. <laughs> one ball, one strike. Two and one. Explain that. I can't. Two balls and a strike. This gal pops it foul back here. Tomorrow is the 50th anniversary of the first ever playoff game in American League history. 1948. Cleveland player manager Lou Boudreau had a big game. Two homers, two run singles as Boston faced Cleveland. Cleveland winning the game 8-3. to three. And It was an interesting choice of pitchers by then manager Joe McCarthy. Joe McCarthy going with Denny Galehouse instead of Mel Parnell then. Great left-hander. Not too many great left-handers in this ballpark pitching for this team. Bill Lee comes to mind. Everybody talking about Bill Lee. I was a spaceman and all that. He could pitch. 17 games, 17 game winner, four years in a row in this ballpark. Who pitched for Cleveland? Knuckleballer Gene Bearden, who was working on one day of rest. Yeah, how about that? Wow. And Joe McCarthy, the manager, came under fire for his choice for his starting pitcher that day. And Fans around here haven't forgiven Daryl Johnson, 1975. Been shitting for Jim Willoughby, the reliever. In game seven against Cincinnati as Vizquel fouls it away. Jim Burton came on, gave up the what was the winning run. And now Jimmy Williams today. I mean, the fans around here have long memories. Yes. Yep. And Jimmy Williams today said, I'm going with Pete Shuring. Common feeling was Pedro Martinez was the right choice. Well, Shurik is working here in the sixth inning, and he gets Vizquel on a pop-up on the infield. Third baseman balance in there, one away. So while we are digging into the history books, we look at what happened 20 years ago yesterday. October 2nd, 1978, another playoff. And it was another disappointing result for the Red Sox. The home run by Bucky Dent, of all people, off Mike Torres. The dramatic three-run home run in the seventh inning, and the Yankees went on to the postseason. The Red Sox had to do another wait till next year. So Jimmy Williams is a guy that you know better than I know. But he's a guy who a couple of days ago said flat out, I'm going with Pete Shurick. He's been under fire around here for making that decision. Everybody's been questioning that decision. And here is Shorick working on a one-hit shutout in the sixth inning. With a resting Pedro Martinez over on the dugout bench. Hoping he'll get a chance to work tomorrow night in Cleveland. Well, and if, if Pedro does work tomorrow night in Cleveland, I mean, the odds go back to the Red Sox as favorites in tomorrow night's game, even though, as we mentioned earlier, the great Cleveland Indian fans, and they do make a difference. Uh, that... Uh, narrows the odds a bit but you'd have to pick the Red Sox uh, tomorrow night if they win here tonight with that guy going a ball and two strikes they paid a dear price in players and in money to bring him here 75 million some good young talent including Carl Bovano to Montreal but right now all eyes on Shorick the one two to justice well hit into center field Lewis is back he will play it off the wall, and Justice has a one-out double. The ball kept slicing away from Lewis into one of the bigger parts of this park. David Justice has a one-out double, and looks like that's it for Pete Shorick, and we'll hear what kind of an ovation Shorick gets for his effort here this afternoon. Eighty-seven pitches. Three shy of the 90 Jimmy Williams was talking about before the game.
Derek Lowe, the sinker balling right hander, takes over. Record of three and nine, an ERA over four, in and out of the rotation during the regular season for Boston. And he will deal with Manny Ramirez with a tying run at second and only one out. Ramirez takes a strike. Manny is 0 for 2. He's flying to left. He's popped out to second. And now faces the right-hander low. A one-out double by David Justice. Zurich goes five and a third. No runs, two hits, four walks, one strikeout. And now it's low. Ramirez could tie it with a hit. That's well hit into right field. Bragg is back to get it. Two gone. And tagging and moving to third is Justice. A loud out as Derek Lowe retires Manny Ramirez. Ramirez was not fooled as he made good contact and lined it to right. He hit it hard enough, but not high enough. Does not get under it. He hits an awful lot of balls hard, doesn't he? Darren Bragg, who is a very good defensive outfielder, made only one error during the regular season, was calm going back after that line drive. Now Fryman takes his strength from low. Tying run at third with two out. Welcome back to Fenway Park. We move to the bottom of the sixth inning. The Indians back to the field. The Red Sox lead by a run, and Valentin comes up empty. Strike one on a 93-mile-per-hour pitch from Bartolo Colon, who has been outstanding in this start this afternoon and now this evening. Valentin, Vaughn, and Garcia Parra for the Red Sox. One ball, one strike. at second base. It looked to me with the naked eye that Wilson had the glove in front of the left hand. Watch the left hand. He was out. He was out, folks. That's what it appeared with the naked eye and the camera appeared to... Justified. Now Mo Vaughn digs in. It's easy to say now, but that's the way I saw it as well. Great play by Justice and left again, and a quick tag by Wilson as Vaughn pops it up. Mo Vaughn pops it up into shallow right center, and Lofton is there to make the catch. One away. You know, the only thing that Terry Kraft possibly, in, in being fair, was the hand on the bag, and did Wilson lift uh -huh. the hand up when the right hand came around? It's possible. Hands on the bag right there. Now, does he lift the left hand up and the right hand stay on the bag? Another view. I'll tell you, I thought it was a good call from that angle. From now, that angle, I... I agree with Terry Graham. Now the pitch outside as they will intentionally walk Garcia Parra. The first, I agree. The first couple of angles, the throw beat him. The glove was down. But as you looked at the back two angles, it looked like the hand of Valentin got in on the bag. Then the tag on the left hand. And 
I'll jump in with you. Can I say, it's almost like Wilson lifted the left hand off the bag as the right hand touched the bag. So extremely close, and it looked like on the last two angles, the Terry Kraft got the call right. The intentional walk to Garcia Parra puts two on with one out, and here's one more look at it. This is the angle Terry Kraft had. The hand's on the bag, and now he lifts it up, and the right hand's there as he's lifting it up. Good call by Terry Kraft. Good play by David Justice yes, to play off the wall and fire a strike. Kraft got the call right, it appears, and now with two on, one away, the batter is Mike Stanley. A ball high from Colon. By the way, that was the first intentional walk of the afternoon handed out by Colon. Third walk overall. A double. Vaughn flied out. The intentional walk. One ball, one strike on Mike Stanley, who is over two. throwing right-hander getting ready along with the lefty Jim Poole. But right now it's Cologne against Stanley. Into left field for a hit. They bring Valentin to the plate. The throw by Justice in time and Valentin is out. Two away, and David Justice is playing left field about as well as you can play it here at Fenway Park. He's playing left field at Fenway like he used to play right field in Atlanta with that strong arm. Valentin out by about five feet. You really have to question the wisdom of Wendell Kim. However, I guess Wendell is saying, well, the bottom of the order hasn't been doing much. But we have to try to score when we can, and from catcher cam, right into your living room. Fine play by David Justice. So the catch and tag by Alomar, the base hit by Stanley, means the end of the day for Bartolo Colon. As Mike Hargrove has seen it up, the hit by Stanley, but the play by Justice and left keeps it a one-run game. We're in the sixth inning with O'Leary coming up. It's the left-hander pool out of the Indian bullpen. What a play by David Justice. Perfect throw to the plate. Well, one of the reasons it's tough to score on balls hit to left field if you're on second base is the left fielder is shallow to begin with. And a strong arm, David Justice gets his man, nailing Valentin. One hop right out in front of the plate. Alomar made the catch and the tag, and Valentin, it wasn't even close. And for that reason, to give you an idea about how smart Garcia Perez is and how smart he is on the bases, he went to third, hoping they'd cut the ball off. O'Leary now facing Poole is in the hole on two. Here's the key right here from catcher Cam. Watch Garcia Perez coming to your screen right there. He wanted the ball cut off because he knew that Valentin was dead at home. Breaking ball strikes out O'Leary. Poole comes in, strikes out Troy O'Leary. A double, an intentional walk, a single in the inning. No damage done. Still a one-run game back after this from your local Fox station. We move to the seventh inning with the Red Sox out in front by a run and low back to work. He got Boston out of trouble in the sixth inning by getting Ramirez in a line drive to right. Travis Fryman on that check swing. High bouncer off the plate. Tommy took a strike. Now a ball, one ball, one strike. Tommy, Sexton, and Alomar. Anybody gets on the number nine hitter, Enrique Wilson is scheduled. 
Joe, are we are we uh, watching a game at Fenway Park, one to nothing in the seventh inning? I think we are. Well, I mean, this is the most uncharacteristic ball game in this ballpark. Just don't see this. Strike two on Tommy, and uncharacteristic of this series. Yeah. This has been a very high-scoring series, while the other series have not been. This has been a couple of lopsided games. And yesterday's game was a 4-3 to three Cleveland victory. Tommy strikes out over the outside corner, and he can't like the call as he makes a comment to Tim Cheetah as he walks back toward the Indian dugout. This ball appeared to be outside to Jim Tomey. But you know what? When you see that right there, it looked like it may have had the front corner. Even though Scott Hattieberg caught the ball off the plate, it could have tailed over the front corner. A lot of late movement from Derek Glow. Now Sexton takes the ball low and away. Tomey had a parting shot for Tim Sheeta as he walked back toward the Indians' dugout. Didn't say much, just was quiet about it, but obviously didn't like the call. Sexton fouls it off his front foot. One ball, one strike. Richie is 0 for 1 with a strikeout and a walk. Mike Hargrove run from game two for arguing balls and strikes in defense of Doc Gooden, and Doc Gooden was run on the call at home plate. And a lot of people think, and I'm one of them, that uh, that really inspired the Indians to come back from a 2-0 deficit and beat the Indians 9-5 in game two. Strike two on Sexton. Alomar next. Here's Doc Gooden. He did not last long in game two of this series because of the home plate umpire Joe Brinkman as Sexton takes a ball in the dirt two and two. And for that reason if Pedro Martinez goes for Cleveland of course if the Red Sox win the Indians will have three strong starters to go against Boston tomorrow night. Jared Wright Doc Gooden and Dave Burba all three rested and ready to go. Just inside the section. And the count runs full three and two. Top of the seventh inning. One to nothing Red Sox. To the third baseman, Valentin. Across the diamond, two goals. Derek Lowe is doing his job as Alomar walks in, and we will remind you to watch for the Gillette Mach 3 Strike Zone Challenge prior to Game 4, the 1998 World Series. You will see one lucky fan get the chance to throw a pitch for $2 million. Not one, two, before Game 4. Two million big ones. Austin Powers, right? That was kind of a combination of Austin Powers and the jerk. <laughs> Austin Powers with Steve Martin. Huh? You got it. <laughs> A strike to Alomar and strike two as Derek Lowe has shut down Cleveland since entering in the sixth. He's faced four. He's retired four. And he has Alomar set up. Gave the same sign, I think, because half the Red Sox team started to leave the field on this. Did Sandy Alomar go around? Uh, close. Close. He did that. Down below at Fenway Park. Anxiety with the people walking into this park. 
cheering on the Red Sox and Boston leads one to nothing in the bottom of the seventh as Poole misses low to Hatterberg with Benjamin and Bragg to follow. Bottom three in the order for Poole who did a great job to get out of the sixth inning. Went right through O'Leary. The Red Sox left two in the inning. They've stranded five in the game. It is not often that you have a chance to talk about th two throws by an outfielder in the same half inning. And that's what David Justice did. Two great throws. He almost got Ballantin at second base. And then he did get Ballantin the second time around at home on the base hit by Stanley. 3-0 on Hanneberg, the catcher. On four straight, a leadoff walk. The key play was obviously David Justice throwing out Ballantin. But watch Nomar Garciaparra. We talked about how he ran right in front of third baseman Travis Fryman, wanting him to cut the ball off. You can see Fryman right there. Ducking, and now Valentin is out, but Garciaparra almost pleading with Fryman to cut the ball off and exchanging an out for a run. Now Benjamin takes a strike over the inside corner, showing bunt. Mike is 0 for 2. Just one out of 11 in this series. It's Garcia Parra. He is producing the bottom of this Boston lineup is not, which as you pointed out, probably the most compelling reason why Wendell Kim decided to send Valentin to the plate. On the hit by Stanley with O'Leary, Hatterberg, Benjamin, the bottom of the order, which has produced nothing. Wendell taking a chance where he normally would not take a chance, but because the bottom of the order has been so futile, he almost had to. Pitch is up, one ball, one strike on Benjamin. At least the first two pitches up there showing Bunt trying to get Hatterberg down to second. Good 3-4. And down to second, Hatterberg with one out. One more look at that play by David Justice. Valentin out at the plate. Compelling view from catcher cam. Leadoff walk, the bunt by Benjamin, and now the number nine hitter, Darren Bragg. Left-handed swinger is 0 for 2. Bragg only one hit in this series. We talked about RBIs. Dominated by Garcia Parra for Boston. He has the only RBI of this afternoon, this evening's game, with a solo home run leading off the fourth. He has 11 in this series. Mulvaughn has seven. Veritek has one, and that's it. A chance for Bragg here with Hanneberg at second and one out. played by Alomar. One ball, one strike. down to second the Indians in the eighth inning will have nine one and two Wilson Lofton and Vizquel if anybody gets on justice 
One to nothing Boston in the seventh. Boston down two games to one. Trying to force game five tomorrow night in Cleveland. A breaking ball for a strike, and it's one and two on Bragg. Jim Poole gets Darren Bragg for the second out here in the seventh. Tuesday, King of the Hill reveals a shocking secret. Then Sue takes road rage to a new level on Costello, followed by Guinness World Records primetime. It's a night of all new episodes Tuesday, starting at 8 Eastern, 7 Central on Fox. Here is Jim Poole exiting. He did his job. The leadoff walk has extended this seventh inning. A runner at second, two out, and Shuey enters for Darren Lewis. Welcome back to Fenway Park. Said Shuey going to break. Shuey continues to loosen up out in the Cleveland bullpen as they go to Steve Reed. Out of the bullpen. Did not have good numbers while with the Indians with San Francisco at the start of the year. For the better part of the season, he was automatic. He deals inside to Darren Lewis with an extra run at second with two out here in the seventh. And that is not unusual for Steve Reed to deal from downstairs. He is a side armor and the running fastball inside of the right-handed batters. Very tough to pull. The pop-up on the infield, and Fryman wants it. Travis puts it away, and a leadoff walk turns into nothing for the Red Sox. We go to the eighth inning. Game four of this series, the Red Sox lead by one. Our overhead coverage tonight, courtesy of the Goodyear Blimp Stars and Stripes from Pompano Beach, Florida. This year, Goodyear is celebrating its 100-year anniversary. 72nd consecutive year for its blimp operation. We welcome you back inside. And Tom Gordon takes over. Well, we talked about the importance of an ace in a starting rotation of Pedro Martinez. Jimmy Williams not electing to go to Pedro Martinez today, hoping that they would get to game five and using him tomorrow night in Cleveland. Well, he is not playing around with his one to nothing game in the eighth inning going to his closer. Gordon, who faces the pinch hitter, Cora, strike one. You do not see too many closers going two innings. But Tom Gordon is well-rested. He did not work yesterday. He has had two days off, Thursday and yesterday. He pitched in game two, allowed one run in one inning. And you look at the regular season for Gordon, which was incredible, 46 saves. And a major league record, 43 consecutive saves. Pretty good combination. A hard, high fastball and a good curveball. Cora pops it into left field. Back to get it. O'Leary puts it away. One down. So the leadoff man is gone here in the eighth inning. And this copyrighted telecast is presented by authority of the commissioner of baseball. And may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form, and the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without expressed written consent. One out, back to the top of the order, and Kenny Lofton, who's 0 for 3. Huge numbers against Tom Gordon for Lofton. Lofton shatters his bat and drops a base hit into center field. So Kenny is one out of four, and there's the tying run lofted on here in the eighth inning. With Vizcal and Justice coming up. Now the battle becomes as compelling, Gordon and Lofton, as Gordon and, and Vizcal. Saws him off. The head of the bat goes one way. Lofton hanging on to the handle, and the ball dropping in front of Darren Lewis. 
Descal, a base stealer by design, will take a pitch or two to give Lofton a chance to run, one would assume. Lofton stole 54 bases in the regular season, was caught 10 times, and he is one for one in this division series. A fastball for a strike to this gentleman. Gordon quick pitched Lofton then. Kenny did not have a chance to get a good jump at first base. The tying run Lofton at first with one out here in the eighth. Into right field. That's a base hit for Vizquel. Back-to-back -back singles for Lofton and Vizquel here in the eighth inning with the Indians down by one. Red Sox fans probably thinking, wouldn't you know it? They get the start from Shorick, five and a third inning, shutout baseball and only two hits. Derek Lowe, an inning and two thirds, he was perfect, striking out two. And then the guy who's been most automatic this season, Tom Gordon comes in and gives up back-to-back -back hits after one was out. So Lofton and Vizcal with Justice digging in. A strike from Gordon. We look back, game two. David Justice in the second inning. This shot with a couple on, two out. A three-run blast to help the Indians win game two back in Cleveland. Lofton is stealing third, and no throw by Hatterberg. The tying run is 90 feet away with one out. It is interesting to watch a base stealer like Lofton when he's on second base. He walks into the line to stay mobile. He doesn't walk away from the base. Watch him walk into the line. Bang, he's gone. No throw. Now first and third with one out, and Justice into deep right center field. In to score is Lofton. Digging for third, and now digging for home is Vizquel. A two-run double by Justice. It's two-to-one Cleveland in the eighth. And Fenway Park is dead white. Except for the Indian dugout as Cleveland has overtaken the Red Sox here in the eighth inning. A fastball to Lofton, and then to Descal, and now to Justice. Once again, Justice has a chance to extend those long arms, and he doubles to the deepest part of the ballpark, allowing Descal to score also. And for the first time in this game, behind David Justice, his second double in a row, the Indians take the lead. Still only one out, and Justice is at second for Manny Ramirez, who hits it hard, but right at Ballantin. He's throwing cross in plenty of time, two out. Gordon has fooled nobody. He has not thrown his curveball in this inning. All fastballs by Tom Gordon. So Gordon, who gave up a run in one inning in game two. Number 17, the third baseman. Has given up three consecutive hits, including a two-run double by Justice. And Gordon has given up the lead. It's 2-1 to one Cleveland in the eighth with Travis Fryman at the plate. Justice at second and two out. Fryman takes a ball. We haven't seen the curveball yet. Nope. To our knowledge, there is nothing wrong with Tom's elbow. That would prevent uh, him throwing the curveball, but he has not featured the curveball in this inning. Two balls, no strikes on Fryman. And I'll say it again. The Red Sox get five and a third shutout innings from Pete Shorick. The game in which most here in Boston thought Pedro Martinez should throw. Derek Lowe, an inning and two-thirds. 
perfect with two strikeouts. And Tom Gordon, who had one blown save in the regular season, has given up the lead here in the eighth inning. Fryman takes low. And the count goes to 3-0. How about that? It's almost six months since Flash Gordon gave up a save and blew a save. Wow. Ryman waits for a 3-0 pitch. Will he cut it loose? Time called at the plate by Tim Sheeta, the home plate umpire. That's low for ball four, and after Cora lined out to left field, we've seen a single, a single, a two-run double, the smash to third by Manny Ramirez for the second out, and now a walk handed out by Gordon to Travis Fryman. That's a good point, Joe, because even the two outs in this inning have been hit hard. The line drive by Cora and the rope by Ramirez. Joe Kerrigan out to talk to one of the major's best relievers, Tom Gordon. What a job this guy did this year. The biggest hit of this the inning, this. Hitter, Jim Off the bat of David Justice. He never blinked going down to first. He didn't want to miss that ball bouncing up against the wall in deep right center. And it's now 2-1. to one. The Indians lead as Tomey takes a ball in the dirt. That was the first breaking ball that we have seen from Flash Gordon. And that's his career against Tom. So these Indians with some pretty hefty averages against the Red Sox closer. Two on, two out, two runs in for Cleveland. One ball, one strike. on first and second with two out. Tommy trying to add to the lead. Up on the count two and one. The Red Sox will have Valentin, Vaughn, and Garcia Parra to the plate in the bottom of this eighth inning. takes ball three, three and one. Great shot of that couple from excited to pensive, and that kind of defines the crowd here at Fenway right now. Tom Gordon trying to end a long top of the eighth inning. Only two runs in for Cleveland as Tommy chased one three and two. Tommy ready to unload, and Gordon got it past him. Tommy ripped one to the second baseman, Benjamin. Three loud outs, two big runs, driven in by David Justice. Part of the order coming up, bottom of the eighth, two to one, Cleveland. Welcome back to Fenway Park. Steve Reed, the right-hander, goes back to work. He came on to retire Lewis with a runner at second and two out of the seventh. He got Lewis on a pop-up. And now we'll work to Valentin to start the eighth inning. And a strike from the side-arming right-hander, Reed, to Valentin, who's two for two plus a walk. You may see three different Cleveland pitchers in this inning. Steve Reed, the right-hander, starting. Oxenmacher to pitch to Mo Vaughn. And Shuey brought in to pitch to Garciaparra. Valentin out in front, strike two. What about the two innings that David Justice had? 
two great throws. One to almost get Ballantin, one to get Ballantin. So his arm did it in the sixth, his arms did it in the seventh. There's no MVP in this round. <laughs> no. But he would get the votes. Absolutely. Nothing and two to count on Ballantin. One away as Reed strikes out Ballantin to start the eighth inning. Right now, let's return to Chip Carey in the Fox Television Center for an update. Okay, Joe, thank you very much. The news out of New York apparently is very good on Daryl Strawberry. A very significant three-hour surgery today. A 16-inch portion of Daryl's large intestine was taken out. The cancerous tumor was removed. Apparently, the doctors say the cancer did not spread. Daryl is resting comfortably at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital in New York City. He'll stay there about a week. And everyone around the world of baseball breathing a big sigh of relief and hopefully it'll be a full and complete recovery for Daryl Strawberry. Back to you in Boston. All right, Chip. Thank you very much. That's great news. Sure great, is. great news for Daryl Strawberry. And we have a moment to continue talking about this as Paul Ossenmacher will make his way in to face Mo Vaughn. And then, as you said, likely another pitching change after Asenmacher deals with Vaughn, with Garcia Parra, the cleanup hitter, after Mo, and Shuey still getting ready out in the Cleveland bullpen. But another word or two about Daryl Strawberry. You had a chance to know Daryl Strawberry at a very young age when he first came up with the New York Mets. He's made some mistakes along the way. He's recovered from those mistakes. And uh, to a man, people you talk to in this game of baseball appreciate what Daryl Strawberry has been able to overcome and root for a man who is one of the nicest men you'll meet in the game today. Coming up in 1983, and uh, his woes have been uh, chronicled, and you often see uh, the team for whom a player played wearing perhaps his number, but rarely will you see uh, teams in the league, other teams in the league wearing number 39, as is the case tonight with Cologne, see Mo Vaughn, and others with uh, Daryl Strawberry on their minds. Paul Ossenmacher, Tim, takes over here in the eighth inning, and as you said, likely a one batter effort for Ossenmacher, and it will be a big one as Mo Vaughn will step in and what fans around here might look at is possibly his last at bat here at Fenway in a Red Sox uniform. Talking to Dan Duquette, the general manager of the Red Sox before the game, he and Moe's representatives have uh, put things on hold until after the season. Obviously a reasonable thing to do, particularly with the playoffs. The last offer made was in the four-year range for right around $36 million, about $9 million a year. Mo feels that he could possibly go out on the market, get more money, and if that's the case, uh, he'll do that. And as we talked about, another line that could be added to that graphic as you look at what he's done in eight years here with the Red Sox, fan favorite. And Mo Vaughn will bat here in the eighth inning. There's a look at Dan Duquette uh, under heavy fire when Clemens walked away, and you wonder what the future is with Mo Vaughn here in Boston. He walks in, and this crowd knows exactly what this at bat might signify as most of this crowd gets to his feet with one out, nobody on here in the eighth. Two to one, Cleveland in the eighth inning. And a ball from Ossenmacher. The thing about Paul Ossenmacher is he has to be, in order to be effective, he has to stay away. And Vaughn with tremendous power the other way. I wouldn't look for Bond to be pulling the ball right here, but a natural stroke toward the wall. <laughs> a strike over the inside corner. The hands went up by Vaughn and called a strike one and one. there and now set up at one and two. Mo is 0 for 3 in tonight's game. He's made three dazzling defensive plays. But Ossenmacher trying to shut him down at the plate for the fourth time tonight. Two and two. Richie Sexton guarding the line at first base. 
Travis Fryman way off the line at third. I would be very surprised to see Mo Vaughn pull a ball down the first baseline. I guess in this situation, you just have to protect against the oddity, and that would be a ball hit down the first baseline. Here it is on two and two. Vaughn into left field. Back at the track, at the wall, off the top of the wall. And Vaughn will dig for second and make it with a one-out double. Mocker comes in to try to retire Mo Vaughn. And Vaughn leaves to a standing ovation as he is lifted for a pinch hitter. If that's his last at bat in a Boston Red Sox uniform, it was big. Well, tonight at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the Atlanta Braves visit the Chicago Cubs. Braves lead that series two games to none. They could close out Chicago tonight. The Astros at the Padres game three. ESPN, 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's tonight. Well, Mo Vaughn with that signature uppercut swing and this off the wall and left. A sequence, the second pitch of fastball inside, and then the breaking ball away, and Austin Mocker misses. And the double off the wall in left field. Those five pitches, people may be talking about that in 10 years when Mo Vaughn's been gone for 10 years. Who knows? Paul Shuey now with Garcia Parra at the plate. Donnie Sandler takes over at second base, running for Mo Vaughn, and he carries the tying run with him. Who better for the Red Sox to have at the plate right now than Nomar Garcia Parra? No one. A strike from the outside corner from Paul Shuey. Tying run at second, one out, and that's off the plate. Tough play for Fryman. Good play by Fryman, two out. Must have seemed like an eternity for that ball to come down for Travis Fryman bounced off the plate. Garcia Parra, who can run, taken care of by the veteran Travis Fryman. Travis Fryman made the best play in this series to perhaps save the game yesterday. In the fourth inning, runners on at first and third, a backhanded play on Garcia Parra's ball. That held the Red Sox to one run, and here he comes in to nail Garcia Parra. But that play yesterday was a huge defensive play for Travis Fryman. Now Mike Stanley. Breaking ball is low. Well, Mo Vaughn has given the Red Sox the chance with a one-out double. Sandler's running for him. Garcia Parra, the bouncer to third. And now it's Mike Stanley with a tying run at third, two out. 2-0 two and oh with O'Leary next. Sox need a two-out hit. Three balls and a strike from Chewy. To extend the inning for Troy O'Leary. Last year, the Cleveland Indians were four outs away from elimination, and Sandy Alomar hit a home run off Mariano Rivera. 
The Red Sox are hoping for something similar in 98. Stanley is relieved for a pinch runner, Damon Buford. So good speed on for the Red Sox with Sandler at third, the tying run. Damon Buford, the go-ahead run at first, two out for Troy O'Leary. And Alomar has just given the middle infielders the sign for what he will do in case Buford runs. And a check on Damon Buford. Saw the numbers for O'Leary, just one out of 15 in this division series. We're in the eighth. Two to one, Cleveland. Ball one to O'Leary. O'Leary, a 270 hitter during the regular season with 23 home runs. Alomar keeps it at the plate, two and oh. That was a very difficult play. Sandy Alomar, not realizing that ball was down, tried to backhand that ball and was fortunate to do that. You don't see many catchers come up with balls that they have to backhand in the dirt, almost through the trap door. O'Leary pops it up behind second. Lofton comes on, and the Indians are three outs away from going back to the ALCS. Vaughn a double. He's finished for the night. Still two to one Cleveland. We move to the ninth inning in this game four. Cleveland leading two games to one and leading the game two to one as the Indians bat against Tom Gordon. And Sexton takes a ball up and in. It'll be Sexton, Alomar, and Cora. Two and zero. Oh. Donnie Sadler stays in the game and plays second base. That moves Mike Benjamin over to first. As Sadler was a pinch runner for Mo Vaughn. Stanley was also replaced, but he's the DH for Buford. And so it's Benjamin at first, Sadler at second. Defensively for Boston, the 2-0 pitch from Gordon. Three and zero. Oh. Gordon had a rocky eighth inning, to use a kind word, after getting Cora on a line drive to left. Three consecutive hits, including the two-run double by Justice, and a hard ground ball out, a walk, and a line drive out. Three balls, no strikes on Sexton. Right down the middle, three and one. Tim, Jimmy Williams is a smart baseball man with good instincts. Took a lot of criticism for starting Pete Shorick in tonight's game. That worked. He brings in Derek Lowe. He was saving Pedro Martinez for tomorrow night, and he still might get the chance to use him. But as Gordon walks the leadoff man here in the ninth inning, I'll ask you if you think Jimmy Williams will be questioned or second-guessed for bringing Gordon in to start the eighth inning. Well, he might be second-guessed, but uh, that's a... That's, uh, I guess the second guesser's delight, but I mean, here's the best you got. He's the guy in the in the bullpen that saved 46 games. He hasn't blown a save since April 14th. He's been two or more innings uh, a bunch of times this year. His last time on August the 11th, he's gone three innings several times. So I mean, how can you how can you question a guy who loses with his best? I mean, it's the best they have. They love this situation, but unfortunately, Gordon coughed up two runs in the eighth inning. And now is given a leadoff walk here in the ninth with Alomar at the plate. An 0 1 count. Ground ball to third, might be. Valentin starts it. Sandler in the game, turns it. 5 4 3, double play. We just at this point don't know which game it will be. Two out, nobody on, and one ball, one strike on Cora. It will be at 7.30 Eastern time tomorrow night, and it could be Boston at Cleveland. It could be the Cubs-Atlanta series in Chicago, game four. Or it could be the series 
out in San Diego with Houston the Padres. One and two now on Cora at the end of tonight's game. Tim and I will select the Chevy truck player of the game. Mike Jackson getting ready for the bottom of this ninth inning. Cora, a floater into center field. Darren Lewis over to get it. Gordon gets through the ninth inning, got around a leadoff walk. The bottom of the order will bat for Boston in the ninth inning against Jackson. We welcome you back for the bottom of the ninth inning here in Boston. Fenway Park, we present to you our Dr. Pepper play of the game. David Justice with that drive into right center field in the eighth inning, scoring two runs. Lofton and Vizquel to put Cleveland out in front, two to one. The only other run of the night, a leadoff home run by Nomar Garcia Parra in the fourth inning for Boston. That's it. A game dominated by pitching, including Boston starter Pete Shorick. And a great effort tonight, Tim, from this Cleveland bullpen. And the latest to come out of that bullpen is Mike Jackson. And Mike Hargrove has worked this bullpen in masterly fashion tonight. He's used five pitchers for the last six hitters for Boston. Hatterberg, the number seven hitter, leads it off and takes a pitch up and in. Two to one, Cleveland leads. If they win, they'll face the Yankees in the 1998 ALCS. If they lose, the series goes back to Cleveland. Off the bat of Hatterberg to the second baseman. Oh, terrible throw, but dug out and saved by Sexton. One away. Mike Hargrove telling us before the game that Richie Sexton is not a great first baseman yet, but he has the hands and the range to be a good one, and he proves it with his hands right here. One down, and Cora bailed out by Sexton, the rookie. And we will have a pinch hitter here in the ninth inning for Mike Benjamin. Midri Cummings will come off the bench and bat for Jimmy Williams. Mike Jackson has two saves in this series. He did allow a home run, a two-run shot in the ninth inning, which made it a one-run game here yesterday afternoon and evening. But for the season, Mike Jackson, his first full year as the full-time closer, saved 40 of 45. Here's Cummings. Jackson picking up for Jose Mesa. When Mesa had all those problems last year, and then picking up for Jose Mesa after he was traded this year. Mike Jackson has just done a terrific job. He can either be a great setup man or a great closer, as he's proven this year. Midri Cummings hit two pinch hit home runs during the regular season and was a good man off the bench for Jimmy Williams. One out, nobody on, one ball, no strikes. High 2-0. Whatever works as Boston tries to get a game five in Cleveland. Two and one from Mike Jackson. Garcia Parra trying to get this crowd going here in the ninth inning. Three and one. the end of the bat for the shortstop is Kell gets an easy hop and throws out Cummings and the Indians are one out away from the 1998 ALCS and the Red Sox are one out away from hearing about the curse of the Bambino again here's the turning point without a doubt with a couple on and one out this shot by David Justice the two run double that's the run production for the Indians tonight, and it might just be enough. Two turning points. Justice's defense and then his offense. Darren Bragg now with two out, nobody on. The last hope for the Red Sox in the ninth. 
A strike over the inside corner. Darren Bragg tonight, 0 for 3. One ball, one strike. The Cleveland Indians trying to get into the American League Championship Series for the third time in the last four years, including 1998. Jackson wants a new baseball. One ball, one strike on Bragg. Trying to get this ninth inning back to the top of the order. The only portion of this Red Sox batting order that's done any damage almost this entire series. The 1-1. One, one. Strike two, and the Indians are one strike away from advancing to the next round. Game over, series over. The Indians are going back to the ALCS. A perfect one, two, three, ninth inning for Mike Jackson. What a game for David Justice. And what a well-managed game this was for Mike Cargrove. Justice with the offense, a pair of doubles, the two-run double in the eighth inning to put the Indians on top for good. David Justice is tonight Chevy Truck player of the game. And Mike Cargrove ought to smile, a combination of Cologne, Poole, Reed, Ossenmacher, Shuey, and Jackson shut down the Red Sox. Garcia Parra, the only Boston Red Sox player right now out in front of the dugout, applauding the fans for their support in 1998. Well, that's great right there. That's stupid. Joining us on our telecast tonight, is Bob Halloran, who has a guest for us. Bob? All right, Dave Justice, you've had a lot of big hits in your career. Was today the biggest? No, today wasn't the biggest. The one I hit in 95 World Series to win it, that was the biggest. But uh, this is a great game for us. I mean, Boston keeps coming, keeps coming. Uh, sure, it came out through a great game against us. But um, I told all the guys, we got to play hard for nine innings, hard for nine innings. And we, we stayed close. And, we are able to win. This series started so poorly for you, 11-3 at home. You're able to bounce back. Is that confidence, experience, or both? Well, it's just like any series. I mean, I never anticipate sweeping any team. So you know you're going to lose one game. Well, that, that first game, we felt like about one game. Now let's go and try to win. First one to three. What about Valentin at the plate? Were you surprised to see him going, and did you feel like you had him? I wasn't surprised because that's the way they play. I mean, very aggressive ball club. And, uh, you know, you, you can't fall window Kim. If I throw the ball offline, you know, he's safe. So I felt confident when I got the ball. If I just relax and throw it, I'm going to get him. All right, thanks very much, Dave. Yeah. Justice, appreciate it. And we'll throw it back upstairs to Joe and Tim. All right, Bob Halloran, thank you very much. Well, Nomar Garcia Parra was the only Red Sox player out in front of the Boston dugout applauding the fans for their support in 1998. Tim McCarver, the Cleveland Indians just keep getting back there, back there, back there. This is a very solid, very deep, very talented team under Mike Cargrove. They came from behind to beat the Yankees in the divisional playoffs last year, and they came from ahead to beat the Red Sox this year. You also have to wonder here in Boston if we saw the final game for Mo Vaughn yep. in a Boston Red Sox uniform. That's what folks around here will turn their attention toward as the Indians turn their attention toward the New York Yankees and the 1998 American League Championship Series. So for Tim McCarver, I'm Joe Buck. So long from Fenway Park in Boston. The final score, 2-1. to one. The Indians win it. They win the series three games to one. Chip Carey and Steve Lyons will be along with more Division Series highlights after these words. Good night from Boston.